Okay, any question on any topic? Before I go on to another topic. Should the government provide credit? credit yeah. The government. The government. The government can and should supply credit, and we should supply credit in a non-usurous way. What do I mean by non-usurous? I mean high levels of interest that entrap people in a debt. The rate of interest that you pay on a debt should be adjusted according to your income. And the lower your income, the lower the level of interest you pay. All interest should be decided in such a way that a person can escape their debt within a 50-year cycle. And any debt that reaches 50 years should simply be cancelled. This, however, should apply to individuals and not to organisations. When it comes to businesses, there should be a different kind of debt system. One where interest rates can be higher. Next question on the topic of Christian economy and Christian principles for the economy. Or any other question, sir. Any question on the Christian faith? So, ladies and gentlemen, the mark of the beast, I don't know if you know this, is subject to a textual variant known and commentated on by Irenaeus, the church father. There is a textual variant that says the mark of the beast is 616. Sorry, I do need to get that. If you could grab it and just put it there. There is a textual variant that says 616 for the mark of the beast. And obviously we all know that in Revelations it talks about the mark of the beast as 666. Now this is relevant to the economy. Why? Because the prophecy of Scripture says that in the future those that do not bear the mark of the beast will not be able to buy or sell. Ladies and gentlemen, I have no opinion about whether the mark of the beast will be literal or metaphorical. I suspect, ladies and gentlemen, that it will be metaphorical. But, ladies and gentlemen, the fact that there is a time coming when Christians will be excluded from the economy and we've already begun to see it happen in the Islamic world Christians are excluded from the highest jobs they are forced to work the lowest paid positions we've already seen it in liberal society where Christians are forced out of the highest jobs like Tim Foran was forced out of the leader as leader of the Liberal Democrats. In other words, there is a Christian bar on being the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. We Christians, therefore, must build a Christian economy with Christian businesses that employ Christians. We must wage economic war against the progressives grip yes. over the economy and that means that the vocation to be a Christian businessman or a Christian worker must be as honoured in the church 
as being a pastor or an evangelist or a prophet or a teacher because building Christian businesses shapes a Christian world. If you control the local high street shop, then you get to decide whether that window is decorated by a rainbow flag or whether PC politics is pushed upon your workers talking about multiculturalism or diversity and inclusion or LGBTQ plus politics and that is why we must build a Christian economy because surely one day the Antichrist will come and we Christians will be excluded from the economy just as we are being so. Next question. Next question. Yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, the futurist Elon Musk <laughs> is dedicated to a future. Okay. His philosophy of life and ideology is a futurist ideology. He wants the human being to become a multi world civilization. And as part of that vision, he wants to see us become cyborgs. <laughs> he wants us to have psycho, uh, cybotic uh, adaptations. I like Robocop. Like Robocop. Okay, okay. That he believes yeah. will create a world like Star Trek. <laughs> where Geordie Lee Forge wears a hairband <laughs> and can see ultraviolet light. <laughs> And ladies and gentlemen, yeah. I know it tickles your funny bone, that's, that's... but don't underestimate the fact that we are living in a world where that is one of the horizons. Because of injuries and our desire to heal people, we are creating cybotic replacements for hands, eyes, ears, and legs, right. ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, Eventually, yeah. this technology will spill out of the medical field. Okay. We will end up living in a world that is more like Alita Battle Angel, uh, where you buy yeah. cybotic adaptions to improve yourself, right. and you end up in a competition. Right. No. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, how should we deal with that, this? We should deal with it by talking about it and by establishing laws and principles that govern the idea of cybotic replacement. Just like we have created laws that in principle can be adopted to govern the development of AI. Is it Zarkov's or Azakov's three principles for AI, artificial intelligence? Does anyone remember what it's called? It'll come up, obviously, no big fans of sci fi here. <laughs> right? Avatar? But, no, not Avatar. Right. But, ladies and gentlemen, yeah. just as we have started to discuss the rules that should govern artificial intelligence, yeah. so also we should discuss the rules of cybotic replacement. Okay. Here is the principle that I offer. Okay, okay. No cybotic replacement of any kind should ever go beyond the natural limitation that already exists. In other words, yeah. If we build a hand to replace a hand that's cut off, the hand should never be able to grip stronger than a human hand. If we build legs to replace legs that have been lost, 
The legs should never allow you to run faster than a normal human being. If we create eyes to replace or sight to replace vision, yeah. it must only ever imitate human vision. Uh, not if we create hearing to replace lost hearing, yeah. it must never exceed the ability of human hearing. Uh, and that should be the governing principle behind all of our cybotic development. Okay. It must be a principle of equivalence to what is natural, ladies and gentlemen. And for those that want to enter into athletics, yeah. they should be given a license to allow them to have adaptions that match the average of the best athletes. Okay. Next question, ladies and gentlemen. Question. On any aspect of the Christian faith, okay. our teachings, principles, values, or their application. Okay. Go on. Going once. Any question on any aspect of the Christian faith going? I think it's not a question. What's the question? They say they are arguments. Bible can, uh, ten Bibles contain six teachings. Yeah. Okay, so it's about the different canons. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, there are charlatans in this park that try to make a big deal about the fact that Christians use different Bibles with different numbers of books. And they try to say that this somehow proves that the Bible is unreliable. Ladies and gentlemen, do not be deceived by these charlatans and liars. The fact that some Christians use 66 books, and some Christians use 73 books, and some Christians use 76 books, and some Christians use 81 books, in no way affects any fundamental Christian doctrine. Roman Catholics, Orthodox and Protestants all believe in the same Jesus Christ. We all believe that he was crucified. We all believe that he is risen. We all believe in the Trinity. We all believe in the Incarnation. We all believe in living by the principle of love. We all believe in the covenant of the church. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, the question is misplaced. The question is, is the message of the Christian faith affected by the fact that there are different Bibles? And the answer to that question is no. Christians have the same faith and the fact that we have different Bibles does not change that. Why? Because we all have the same New Testament. Every Christian has the same 27 books of the New Testament. But, ladies and gentlemen, the Muslims who talk about different Bibles are ignorant of the fact that they have different Qurans and ignorant about the fact that they have different Hadiths. Okay, okay. And depending on which Hadiths they use, yeah. their Islam looks very different indeed, okay. ladies and gentlemen. Diferente. Next question. Oh, can I ask a scripture oh, you that's online about debt that you mentioned yeah. earlier on? Okay, okay. Yeah. So Lisa Blythe has said, Street Mike, I beg, beg you <laughs> to tell Bob that don't matter as long as it's for production and not consumption. Okay. The West is doing financial Ponzi scheme, shares, etc. And China is high debt but manufacturing. Right, ladies and gentlemen, she raises a good point. Yeah, she does. Which is that as Christians, if you remember when the brother asked about the bank lending credit, yeah. and I said that what interest rate you pay 
should be directly calculated by your income so that no debt can go beyond 50 years and that after 50 years your personal debt should be cancelled. However, ladies and gentlemen, I also said that this should be different for organisations and debt for production the, the, it's all right, sister. Debt for production is something that makes sense. We should allow credit <laughs> to build production. Nice ladies, ladies and gentlemen, we should allow companies to take on bigger debts than individuals. But, ladies and gentlemen, yeah. our problem in the West is that because we worship the god of Mammon, we have been acquiring a debt that is all about consumption and not production. We have been importing more than we have been exporting because the people demand to have their goods, ladies and gentlemen. And that means that for decades we have ended up Ladies and gentlemen, raising the national debt higher and higher until now it matches the GDP. Sister, <laughs> all right, Jeez, leave him alone, please. You're not helping. You're really not helping me. You're just going to set him off. Please just leave him alone. Look, guys, he was quiet until she started tackling him. Play chess, JC. Play chess. Play chess. What do you <laughs> Stop <laughs> colouring in crayon. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, we should direct our national debt towards production rather than import so that we can create the structures for export and dig our way out of debt by acquiring wealth little by little. Next question, ladies and gentlemen. Can you foresee a, a centralised government running the world at some point? Ladies and gentlemen, do I foresee... Beneficial? Do I see a centralised government running the world? Not in any of our lifetimes. Okay. And therefore, since it isn't a concern of my lifetime, I don't spend time worrying about it. Okay. Do you know why? Why? Because I do see the danger of an Islamic government dominating Nigeria. Okay. Because I do see the danger of an Islamic government dominating the Netherlands. Okay. Because I do see the danger of demographic collapse. Because I do see the danger of the environmental crisis. And I would rather tackle the real issues of my lifetime okay. than worry about the possible issues of someone else's. Okay, Next question, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> On any aspect of the Christian faith, he was quiet until she tackled him. <laughs> Thank you, Uncle. Next question on the topic. Next question. Bro, you ask me this regularly. <laughs> like, I'm sure this guy comes once a week just to ask me this question. But unfortunately, it wasn't on the topic about Christianity. I'm inviting any question about the Christian faith on any aspect of the Christian faith. So this is your chance to ask a question. Going once. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, there are pastors operating in the body of Christ who are working a Ponzi scheme in which they are saying, if you give to me, God will make you rich. That is a lie. That is a filthy lie from the bowels of hell. Ladies and gentlemen, they are setting up a pyramid scheme in which they are becoming rich 
by fleecing the body of Christ, brothers and sisters. Sister, it's okay. Please just leave him alone. He's fine. Honestly, I appreciate it. But the brother's fine, he's just standing there with a sign, he has the right to do that. And every time you do that, he stops talking. Just leave him alone. Thank you, Uncle, thank you. I've just, Nobody could see him, I've just only stuck up I saw him. I've just stuck up for you. I've just stuck up for you, be kind. Okay, right, ladies and gentlemen. If you go to a prosperity teaching church, okay. I encourage you to leave. Yeah, leave it. Your pastor is fleecing you. Your pastor is using the Bible to lie to you. Your pastor is an ignorant biblical teacher. And to all of you Christians in Nigeria, you need to abandon these lying charlatans and you need to go and find the teachers who are teaching Christian solidarity in our churches. Because we Christians must build networks of solidarity against those who persecute the church. And that is a much more important issue to talk about than your blessing. Because your blessing is a sop to the religion of the self that has been brought by modernity and the enlightenment and is not rooted in the apostolic teaching. Next question. Another person online, Adam S, has asked about implementing the Benedict option. So, ladies and gentlemen, how as Christians can we implement the Benedict option? Simple, move closer to good Christian churches or good Christian monasteries. And when we collect geographically, and we do so deliberately to build Christian communities, then we build the Benedict Option, ladies and gentlemen. And let's be clear what the Benedict Option is. It is the idea that the people of God move into an area in their tens of thousands so that we become the main community in an area, that we dominate the economy, that we dominate the education system, that we dominate the political system, and then we fashion that local area according to our beliefs. This principle works for whoever uses it. Don't believe me, go to Tower Hamlets. Don't believe me, go to Golders Green. Don't believe me, take a tour around Northern Ireland. Don't believe me, go and live amongst the Amish. Whoever practices the principle of the Benedict Option ends up becoming the one that forms and fashions the area in which they live. If it can work for these other communities, it can work for every Christian community. And so I invite all Calvinists to go and set up a Benedict community, all Presbyterians to go and set up a Benedict community, all Orthodox to go and set up a Benedict community, all Roman Catholics to set up a Benedict community, all Evangelicals to set up a Benedict community, and then let's just see the survival of the fittest about which one ends up converting the United Kingdom first. Next question on any aspect of the Christian faith. Right. So, ladies and gentlemen, there are some charlatans in this park that lie about our Lord when they say that our Lord said, I have only come for the house of Israel. 
and that therefore that means that the Christian faith has distorted Jesus' teaching by saying that it is for all people. It is true that Jesus said, I have only come for the house of Israel. He did only come for the house of Israel. However, in Matthew 28, 18 and 19, in a verse that all of these charlatans willfully ignore, our Lord sends out his church into the nations to baptize in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit and to make disciples of all nations. Something that these charlatans and liars ignore when they quote the passage that says that Jesus only came for the house of Israel. How do we surmise these two positions? Jesus indeed only came for the house of Israel. But Jesus commissions his church for the nations. And so it is right for the church to go into the nations to bring them to Christ. And Muslims are simply wrong to say otherwise. Next question on any topic about the Christian faith. Going once, going twice. Any questions about the Christian faith? Ephesians 2.12 says about the commonwealth of Israel as well. Can I read it? Yeah, of course. We're all part of it. Any believer? So in Ephesians 2.12, she says this, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant promises, having no hope without God in the world. This demonstrates that the covenant that the church follows is for the world. The nations are grafted in into Israel. That is the Christian faith, a faith for the world. Jesus came to bring a new covenant for the world, not just for Israel. And furthermore, it demonstrates that we Christians are in commonwealth with one another. We should be concerned with the lives of our brothers and sisters wherever they are in the world, whether they're in our fellowships, in our neighborhoods, on our streets, or in other countries. And we should dedicate ourselves to the service of the church wherever the church exists. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll take one last question and then I'm going to stop. Final question. Going once, going twice. Got a question? Oh. Is that a question or a comment? So the brother asks me to share a proof that Jesus is God. Very well, I will. Okay, bro, there you go. Here's the proof. A clear proof that Jesus is God from Revelations 22, okay. verse 12. Behold, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me to remember, to render to every man according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. According to Islam, who is the first and the last? What? God. Jesus calls himself the first and the last. So who is Jesus calling himself? Do you want to come round and talk? Looks like he wants to talk.